Okay. Now that Brian's here, we can start. <laughs> uh, we'll get started. Thank you for uh, your perseverance, making it to 4 p.m. I hope you all got ice cream. And uh, this is the session on uh, using video to explore critical cases. My name is Wayne Miller. I'm the Director of Educational Technologies at Duke Law. And uh, we're going to talk today about a project that is the brainchild of uh, Professor Tom Metzloff. He talked about the very early stages of this project at last year's Cali, which was uh, in Durham, North Carolina at Duke. And uh, we're going to give you an update, give you some of the um, lessons learned, uh, some of the uh, considerations that have come up during the last year. Uh, the way it's going to go is Todd is going to give an introduction. Uh, you're going to see an example video. I'll talk a little bit about the issues and successes that came out of this video. And then Todd's going to go into uh, a technical, more technical, but still very interesting discussion about video production in this context. Okay, Todd. Okay. Um, again, thanks for hanging in there for this last session of the day. Um, I'm Todd Shoemaker, and uh, I've been working on the Distinctive Aspects Project for uh, about a year now. And basically what we're doing is we're making short documentaries on key Supreme Court cases. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about how this project came about, um, and then I'm going to talk kind of through the process of making one of these videos, and then we'll show you one. The uh, Distinctive Aspects Project is based on a course that's taught at the law school called, um, coincidentally enough, Distinctive Aspects of American Law. It's, uh, it's taught to our international LOM students, and basically what it does, it's, it's kind of a primary to interesting topics of um, the United States legal system that are kind of unique to it. Uh, topics such as affirmative action, punitive damages, judicial elections, uh, arbitration. I think there's maybe 16 topics total. Um, and Tom Metzloff teaches the class. Uh, what he had done in the past, last year he taught affirmative action and he had his students read Grutter versus Bollinger, which was the Michigan law affirmative action case uh, that was just decided this year by the Supreme Court. And he had one of the named plaintiffs come in and speak to his class. Uh, Dean Dennis Shields, who was the dean at Michigan's law school and is currently our dean of admissions. Um, so dean, Sh dean Shields came in and spoke to his class, and Professor Metzloff thought, well, instead of having him come in every year, why don't we sit him down and interview him, um, and I can show the video next year. So we did that, and it worked pretty well. And um, maybe a month later, Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor came, so we sat her down and interviewed her as well. And um, Professor Metzloff started thinking, well, we can really bring in a lot of interesting ideas and people um, by going out and shooting some of these interviews. And instead of just bringing in Dennis Shields, let's go and talk to Barbara Gruder and get her side of the story and put them both together in a video. So that was kind of the idea behind this all. Um, a grant came along, and we started to put our production team together. So that's basically how the project got started. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the process that goes into making one of these videos. The first step, which is probably the most crucial, is, is choosing the case. Um, the cases that we look to, uh, to do are fairly recent. We go out and we speak to the actual parties involved. This isn't just a bunch of legal experts discussing the finer points of, of this case. This is the actual plaintiff, the actual defendant, and the actual lawyers. Um, and because of the time and expense of making one of these, it's important that the case is key and it's going to be read year after year by law students. And, you know, that's kind of tricky, anticipating what case is going to be considered a landmark case down the road. Uh, so we are careful to try and choose cases that won't be outdated and won't be overruled, which is why we uh, choose cases that have gone through the Supreme Court. Um, if the case has been decided on by the Supreme Court, it's got the national relevance we're looking for, um, and it's more likely to be around for a while. Once we decide on a case, we test the waters to see what kind of interest we can generate um, by the parties involved. Our goal is to create 
really a balanced story, and we can't do that if we've only got one side willing to talk to us. Most of the lawyers are willing to talk to us because this has, by and large, been um, a highlight to their legal career. But the plaintiffs or the defendants, they're not always willing to speak to us. It can, it's, it's a lot more difficult convincing them to. Um, these stories are very personal to them. They've, they've been dealing with the ramifications of it for years, and sometimes they just want to put it behind them. Um, but having these people tell their stories really provides a whole other dimension to the case that reading it just doesn't. It, it really humanizes the case. And they help to explain the motivations of the people, um, the goals of the parties, and really clarify some key factual aspects of the case that is not really apparent from reading all the court summaries. Um, hearing the story directly from the parties really drives home what the case was about to them, uh, not only the impact it had on the legal system, but to themselves. And I think that's really the added value of this project. Um, law students read so many cases each year, and the Supreme Court summaries offer a fairly sanitized version of the facts. With these videos, they really put the dispute into context and uh, really humanize each case. So if we've convinced enough people to talk to us, the next step is to try and become experts on the case. We want to know more about the case than the people we're talking to. Um, that way we understand the case, um, our interviews are more productive. We always learn new things when we go out and do these interviews, but knowing ahead of time how the interviews will fit into the story is really helpful. Um, you can, if you have a good idea of how the story will play out and how the interview will fit into that, we'll make sure we get what we need from the interview um, and ask more informed questions. So our next step, we fly out to where the case took place and we start interviewing people. Usually we ta travel with a three-person crew, Professor Metzloff, myself, and a research assistant. Um, our interviews range from 30 to 60 minutes, depending on how important the person is in the case. And um, Professor Metzloff is the lead questioner but we all kind of interject questions because we all kind of have a different perspective at looking at these. Professor Metzloff is interested in the legal aspects. I'm thinking more of the story and how that's going to play out. And our research assistants, they've usually just been taught the case the semester before, so they have interesting questions of their own. Um, it's a nice collaborative effort. And it's important because, like I said, we need to get what we need from these interviews. There's no retakes. And if we get back to the editing room and we've got holes in our story, um, it's hard to deal with. So, once we get back to Duke, we have the hours of footage transcribed, which is really helpful to distill the key points without sitting through hours of footage. Um, we probably shoot eight to ten hours of footage per case, and our goal is eventually to condense it down to a 20-minute video. Professor Metzloff will read the, translate, or the transcripts, trying to identify the best parts of each interview, and then we'll digitize all that footage, and then we'll start condensing it down even further. Once we've done that, we start trying to assemble the narrative. Um, usually at that, point, at that point, we're at about an hour in length, um, so we've still got to get it back down to the 20 minutes. So we pick and choose kind of what key points are critical and what points can be left as maybe teaching points um, that we don't ad address. Throughout this process, we are um, writing narration. We use narration in the videos to kind of smooth things out and um, make the pieces fit together. So we're constantly revising that. And even once we get to our 20-minute mark, we look really hard to see if the story is accurate and if it's balanced. We'll literally sit with the stopwatch and see if both sides got equal screen time. We'll show the video to people and say, well, were you more sympathetic to one side or the other? Um, our goal is to create a balanced story that accepts the validity of each position and um, puts no emphasis on either side. And because we're trying to present an independent view, it really helps us to do future projects. Um, if we show them a copy of the tape and they see we have no agenda, we're not going to burn them. We're just giving them a chance to tell their side of the story. It's a lot easier to convince people to talk with us. Um, once we finally are completely locked down on our narration and our everything, um, we have it, the narration recorded by a professional voiceover, which I think adds a lot of production value. Um, I start smoothing everything out and adding in background footage to make the case more, or to make the video more interesting visually. And um, we add court documents and graphics, and then that's that's pretty much it. So I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to show you one of our finished products. Let me give you just a little background on the case. 
It's uh, BMW versus Gore, which is uh, a punitive damages case. Dr. Ira Gore had purchased a brand new BMW and found out about a year later that his car had been repainted before he purchased it. There was some acid rain damage, um, but it was not disclosed to him. So he sued BMW. He was awarded $4,000 in compensatory damages, but $4 million in uh, punitive damages from a jury in Alabama, which at that time was a state notorious for granting large punitive damages. Uh, BMW obviously appealed to the Supreme Court, and um, our videos take the story up to the Supreme Court level, and then we let the professors take it from there. Um, so let's, uh, let's watch. case on punitive damages. After graduating from Duke Medical School, he returned to his native Birmingham, Alabama, where he was a highly regarded oncologist. His colleagues were largely Republican, conservative, and decidedly anti-litigation, believing that tort reform was needed to deal with the perceived medical malpractice crisis. The dispute with BMW began when Dr. Gore decided it was time to buy a new car. We were particularly attracted to the, the BMW fosters. Uh, Drove them. They were nice. They were available in, in five speed, and I liked the black car. It, it just it was nice. And it's at a time when, uh, probably if I reflect back, I was feeling a little more middle aged and sort of settled in and having children. And well, I mean, I wanted something that looked, you know, fast and youthful, probably. Dr. Gore wanted to keep his car looking new, so after several months, he took it to be thoroughly cleaned at a local Birmingham shop owned by Leonard Slick. We had used him before to detail some of our cars, and in terms of detailing, he does more than the average cleaning job. You take your car to Leonard, and it comes out of his shop and it looks like it's brand new. I go over there at the end of the day, and uh, there's my car, and it looked great. Told Leonard it looked great. I have bad news for you. Uh, your car's been repainted. Well, as I got to the roof of the car, I noticed there was a triangle-like pattern that was unlike the rest of the car, and this led me to believe that it was hand-painted. This was an area on the roof, both the front and the rear, that showed that there was an arc by a human's arm that was painted in the car, as opposed to the computer process. Dr. Gore was disturbed by the news that his car had been repainted. I'm sure there was some aspect of embarrassment on my part that I've been driving this car around for for nine months, and I had thinking this this is you know, a great vehicle, and it's building my ego to have this car, and now oh, it was repainted. You didn't get what you thought you had. He was uh, interested in is the quality of the work as good as the BMW quality work. And I said, well, no, it isn't. And I said, well, what's the long-lasting effects? And I said, well, the long-lasting effects is that your car is going to look like it's been repainted. It's going to have chips in it. It's going to scratch easier. Uh, it's just going to look worn. This car is going to look five years old in two years. The difference in value of any car that's been repainted has been proven to be 10% less than what another car sitting next to it. Slick had seen a repainted BMW in his shop before, and he offered Dr. Gore some advice on how to proceed. I suggested to Mr. Gore to file suit, and uh, he had said that he had lawyers, and I said, well, I'm sure that you do, but I'm sure that they're all doctor lawyers, and he says, well, that's quite right. And I said, well, here, let me give you the card of somebody that's already working on a similar case. Slick recommended that Dr. Gore contact A.W. Bolt, an experienced Birmingham trial attorney. Bolt was already representing his cousin, Tom Yates, who had also purchased a repainted BMW. I got a call from um, my cousin, first of all, uh, who in his chair in Birmingham, uh, named Tom Yates. He said uh, he was mad as a wet hen. He bought a brand new BMW all in the He thought it was perfect. He borrowed his buddy's truck to use during the day while his buddy was cleaning up his car. And he took his buddy's truck back and he says, you know, Larry, you really need to get the front end worked on this truck. It doesn't run real good, and Leonard says, well, it's better than your brand new BMW that's been wrecked and repainted 
Dr. Gore retained Bolt to represent him, and suit was filed against BMW in December 1990 in Jefferson County, Alabama. Although one of his goals was compensation, Dr. Gore was interested in more. I was someone that recognized this as being wrong and felt there was likely someone to blame. I wanted to be paid for my loss, and I didn't want them to do it anymore. After the suit was filed, it was up to David Cordero, BMW's corporate counsel at its headquarters in Woodcliffe Lake, New Jersey, to formulate a response. Prior to Yates and Gore, we had no issues with respect to our quality of our paint. We'd never been sued before. This type of lawsuit was a lawsuit that was attacking our integrity, our reputation, our processes, our policies. So it was a very important lawsuit for us to try to defend. It was absolutely a bet your company type of case. A critical issue in the case was the propriety of BMW's policy regarding disclosure of repairs to new cars. We thought all along that BMW had a horrible business practice. They had adopted a written policy in 1983 and were very proud of it and spelled out what they were going to do with damaged goods. If the damage were under a certain level, they were going to just go ahead and send them out in routine chain of distribution to the dealership. Nowhere was anybody going to be told. That meant the dealers were going to get damaged goods, and they would not know, and therefore the consumer would not know. We had this policy where we wanted to let consumers know, and our dealers know, that anything above 3% was repaired by our dealers, that anything above 3% was considered significant. Anything below 3% would still be sold as a new vehicle. Anything above 3% would go into a company car service. And this was determined based on the current statutes that were in existence at that time. In formulating its policy, BMW surveyed state consumer protection statutes dealing with disclosure of damage to new cars. Not all states had such provisions. <laughs> Alabama, for example, did not. The states with statutes used different percentage thresholds for mandating disclosure. The California statute, for example, defined any repair damage over 3% to be material and therefore something that had to be disclosed. And the most stringent statute was a 3% statute. And we thought that by having a policy that mirrored the most stringent statute in the states at that time, we would be sort of safe. It would be considered a safe harbor. We weren't concerned about our process or about a disclosure policy because we thought our disclosure policy was the best in the industry. BMW was particularly concerned that the case had been filed in Alabama given its reputation for awarding large punitive damages against corporations. At that time, Alabama was known uh, and being notorious for uh, issuing punitive damages, large punitive damage verdicts against companies. I don't think that Alabama was ever a train gone wild like it was painted. Alabamians, by their nature, consider themselves fair people and uh, don't consider the world being made for fair people. Alabamians have been willing to pass those kind of judgments on people. And the plaintiff's legal theory was based on Alabama's fraud statute, that BMW had suppressed a material fact that it was under an obligation to communicate to Dr. Gore. As explained by BMW's trial counsel, Michael Quillen, plaintiff's lawyers in Alabama frequently claimed fraud as a basis for seeking punitive damages. Fraud was a very popular cause of action in Alabama. We rarely saw a contract claim that didn't have a fraud count with it. The threat of punitive damages troubled David Cordero. When I first read the case and I looked at the, the circumstances around it, I had some concerns about whether or not we weren't disclosing what we probably should be disclosing. And then as the case progressed and I learned more about our painting procedure, I became more confident that we were doing the right thing, the proper thing for the consumer and for the company. In order to assess the nature of the alleged damages to the car, it is helpful to understand something about BMW's painting practices. Painting is an important part of the manufacturing process for a new car. After the car is completely assembled, then they have to start preparing it for paint. They uh, use uh, electrostatic application when it's in a bathtub to apply the primer to get the best possible adhesion from the primer to the steel. And then the other uh, paint materials come on top of the primers. The temperatures in which those applications are dried at, they're very high temperatures. They, they vary between 375 and 385 degrees. The whole process is critical as far as the, the quality of the paint finish.
BMW manufactured its cars in Germany. They needed to develop facilities in the United States to prepare cars for distribution to its dealers. There are BMW facilities, uh, BMW employees are work, they're trained by BMW. We went ahead and used these multi-million dollar facilities and all these paint processes to duplicate what the factory in Germany does. It was believed that the damage to Dr. Gore's car happened when soot from a passing ship landed on it. After mixing with rainwater, the contamination became acidic, producing ringlets on the original paint. BMW sent the car to be repaired at its Brunswick, Georgia Vehicle Preparation Center. Daniel Duke describes the repair process. We neutralize the contamination, remove any of the trim items that are on those panels so that uh, all that's exposed is the painted surface. Um, prepare it by mechanically sanding and then apply it with a two component urethane top coat. Uh, once it's finished, we inspect the paint finish to make sure that there's no imperfections in it. Um, if everything passes, then we reassemble the car and, and detail it. For Dr. Gore's car, I would estimate roughly 12 hours of labor and um, $150, $175 worth of paint materials. A.W. Bolt disagreed that the repair paint was of the same quality. In a repair city, of course, it's a whole different thing because you've got a complete vehicle sitting in. And they use an entirely different kind of paint applied under entirely different kind of circumstances. And there's no way those two paints are going to ever look alike and they're not going to wear alike. An important preliminary issue in the case was the scope of discovery. Bolt wanted extensive documentation of all repairs to new BMWs over an extended period. We had to go to the various departments and try to determine what documents were in existence, not only with respect to the policy that we established during the company, but we also had to look at the vehicle preparation centers and get all the repair orders from the vehicle preparation centers, and I believe it was a 10-year period. And this was astronomical. So the investment in a case of this kind is huge. And when you take on a multinational, multi-billion dollar company like BMW, uh, you know they're going to fight fiercely, you know they're not going to surrender, you know they're not going to admit they did wrong. They're going to make the cost of that process extremely expensive. The Yates case was tried first. After a week-long trial, a Birmingham jury awarded Yates $4,000 in actual damages, but no punitive damages. As A.W. Bolt prepared to try Dr. Gore's case, he contemplated refining his arguments. Very disappointed with the verdict, but we recognize I mean, that's the nature of the jury system. And uh, we knew when we struck the jury on Monday that we ended up with some jurors who would not have given, we don't think they would have given Jesus punitive damages against Pompey Pilate. A key issue in the Yates trial was competing expert testimony over the quality of the paint process. We had gone head-to-head -head with them in the Yates trial on a technical basis showing that it was impossible to repair one of these vehicles back to factory standards. And we explained that in great detail with a very qualified expert. To rebut the plaintiff's expert, BMW offered the testimony of Daniel Dute. The quality of the work, um, the paintwork that was applied to the car, the equipment that was used, the materials that BMW used, the facility that we applied that paint in was equivalent to a factory paint job. The feedback that I got from reading the face of the jury was they seemed satisfied with that answer. After the Yates jury failed to award punitive damages, Bolt and co-counsel John Haley decided not to use the paint expert at the Gore trial. First case, we got bogged down in proving that a repainted car was worth less than a uh, brand new one. Second trial, we assumed that is a given, that nobody wants to repaint an automobile when they pay full price for a brand new one. Dr. Gore's case was next to be tried. The trial began with jury selection. We didn't use a jury consultant. We thought we did a good job in picking the jury. Mr. Gibson, uh, the foreman, we thought that he would be on our side because he did own a BMW. We thought that based on his experience and based on our interview of him, that uh, he would have been a good person for us. He didn't turn out. To convince the jury to award punitive damages, plaintiff's attorneys portrayed BMW's disclosure policy as willfully deceptive. Well, we basically told the story of of an arrogant company that didn't care what the rules in America were because the rules in America did not allow BMW to do what it put in its written policy in 1983 and proceeded to uh, hatch a plan where they could make sure nobody would know out here in the consumer land uh, what they were doing. And it went on for years and years before it got caught. A.W. Bolt 
but was very charismatic in both cases. He's a very good trial lawyer, he's very engaging, and he really gets the jury to listen to him. I think he was more so in the Gore case. We made an argument that it was just like some of the outlet malls. You can go in and you buy polo shirts and get a 10% discount because they're not exactly perfect. They're still worth an awful lot of money, but they're not worth the uh, first quality merchandise. And that was what we said. We, we, didn't, we paid for first quality merchandise and we got seconds. Cordero disagreed with the factory outlet analogy. He argued that slightly damaged products can often be fully repaired. If you take a piece of furniture that has been scratched and shipped, the dealer is going to sand down that scratch and is going to stain it to match the rest of the table and is going to sell it at the new factory price. A jeweler is going to polish that gold ring and is going to polish away some of that gold while doing it, but it's still a new ring. Same thing with an automobile. Dr. Gore was a key witness at trial. At times he felt he was an actor on a stage. I was coached to be part of that show in terms of how I would present myself to the jury, how I would look at the jury. They told me largely to be myself. They told me that I'd be pretty good. One of the best moments in favor of our case was when the defense tried to separate me from the jury as being a professional and I should have known that the car had been repainted. I said, man, no, I really was just like the jury, and, and I, I didn't have any expertise in this, and I had to trust in dealership and telling me what, whether I was buying a new car or not. Plaintiff's attorneys made the following closing argument to the jury. Four million dollars in profits that they have wrongfully taken from people, and that's wrong, ladies and gentlemen, that's just wrong. And they ought not be permitted to keep it. And you ought to do something about it, and that's your job. I urge each and every one of you, and hope that each and every one of you has the courage to do something about it. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to return a verdict of $4 million in this case to stop it. Dr. Gore had gone back to work while the jury deliberated. He soon got the call that the jury had reached its verdict. At that point, you've got this uh, emotional reaction. Your heart's beating fast, and you're thinking, oh, well, what's going on? You, you, you tear out of the car, uh, you turn the wrong way on a one-way street, trying to get down to the courthouse. The jury awarded Dr. Gore $4,000 in compensatory damages, <coughs> and more importantly, punitive damages of $4 million. They uh, were able to convince the jury to take the approximately 1,000 repair orders, multiply it by the $4,000 in diminution in value, or the 10% of the $40,000 vehicle, and they came up with $4 million. The jury bought it. The jury bought it. Bolt felt the large award was appropriate and necessary to send BMW the right message. We tried the Yates case, remember, four months before, and it only cost them $4,000 to tell a lie. So they kept on doing it. When it cost them $4 million, five days after the Gore trial, the BMW executive board met and changed its policy. That's what you have to do with punitive damages. You have to assess an amount and get the job done, and no one knows what that is. Dr. Gore and his legal team were elated. I mean, it's the closest celebration I've ever had to winning the World Series. The legal team all goes to a, a hotel and there's champagne flowing and uh, won the war. Of course, the war was not over. BMW immediately began planning its appeal. The reaction by the company was basic shock. They could not believe that we have lost a case in Alabama over a $601 paint job to the tune of $4 million in punitive damages. The uh, issue seemed pretty clear from the very beginning for appeal. The award just shocked the conscience. It was $4 million for one vehicle for one person. Our processes not only occurred in Alabama, but it occurred in states outside of Alabama. And Alabama was punishing us for those acts that occurred outside of its own borders. Even though the Alabama Supreme Court, on direct appeal, reduced the award to $2 million, that was still a major setback for BMW. The company decided to file a petition for certiorari to the United States Supreme Court. While that court grants review in only a small percentage of cases, BMW thought they had a good chance. We knew the U.S. Supreme Court was struggling with punitive damages. The climate was such politically that uh, the business community, were, they were looking for cases to take up to challenge uh, what we 
research we're doing on punitive damages. You would read in the paper about Alabama, the, the tort hell of Alabama, the lottery, the punitive damage lottery here. We came up with the strategy that perhaps we should go out there and try to solicit the assistance of these other companies or organizations. And it turned out that we had an enormous support for our cause. A case like this was just waiting uh, for somebody to grab it and turn it into a poster child. The Supreme Court granted review and prepared to decide what would become one of its most important cases. Okay. Uh, all right, I hope you enjoyed that. We, we decided to, to show all 20 minutes because you see it goes through a lot of content. And so uh, uh, to, to cut it short would, I think, be unjust to the process. Uh, the question comes up immediately, well, this is an awful lot of labor. What does it get you? So we did some... Uh, preliminary uh, examination of, uh, I believe it was two classes that Tom Metzloff was teaching in the fall. And I'm going to show some results and discuss it a little bit and contextualize my interest in uh, kind of interfacing with the project uh, on the production of video. Uh, he gave a quiz to his class, and he divided both these classes, and he divided these classes into two groups. Uh, one group uh, viewed the video and then came to class. They, I believe they had their discussions and then they took the quiz. Uh, the other class did not see the video. Uh, they were both instructed to spend the exact same amount of time, so the video group spent less time, in theory, with their texts. And, uh, and so he, he collected some results. You'll see here the, the non-video group and the video group this measures the correct answers in percentage. Uh, the, the thing that interested me on this is that you do see that there are, there are clear results for uh, a number of the questions, uh, just some factual questions. What was the damage? What was the legal basis? Uh, what were prior claims? What was BMW's policy? Uh, the Yates case, uh, the Alabama decision? You can see uh, some real value there. Now, there were also questions about, I'm going to try to mark this up, about um, the legal arguments themselves. Now, that was raised in part in the video, but obviously the video does not deal with the Supreme Court decision. It's not the brief that the students read, which is uh, different content. You can see that there was some uh, measurable advantage, but not really, um, since these groups are small, not a terribly statistically uh, useful difference uh, in terms of the legal argument. Hence, uh, I think Todd's point about uh, making this a human story is, is to the point. Now, one thing to say about uh, BMW versus Gore uh, it's, it's a very specific case. There are, all the cases have their own uh, kind of dynamic, and we're going to address the dynamic right now. Uh, before I go to the next slide, he asked some subjective questions, how people felt about aspects of this case. What I'd like to do now is kind of get your sense. Uh, if, if you agree that, uh, let me see how he phrased it, because I want to match Do you believe that uh, punitive damages are appropriate in this kind of case? If you believe so, please raise your hand. Okay, I'd say the percentage is pretty high, uh, well over 50%. Uh, I'd also like to know if you feel more strongly having watched the video. You got a very brief uh, introduction, kind of splash, $4 million, and then you saw the video. Did the video make you think more strongly that uh, punitive damages are appropriate? Okay, it's a smaller, a much smaller percentage, but there's still some. Uh, we saw some interesting results when, when the, the subjective questions were asked. 
Now, uh, uh, this is hard to, to visualize, I think, a little bit harder. You'll see some reversals, like right here. Uh, those who saw the video disagree that Gore was motivated by money. Those who did not see it, that was their first su supposition. Uh, otherwise, you see th just changes in degree, like right here. Just a little change in degree, uh, here as well, uh, also here. Now, this is where, where I came in. Um, we also had focus groups with the students, who, uh, the students who saw these. And we asked them, do you think this video is fair? And almost universally, the answer was, yeah, it seems fair. It's, it, you represent both sides. But what we saw in the results uh, of, of the classes is that you went from almost uh, a split environment to a strongly favorable uh, environment for punitive damages. Uh, by that measure alone, it would be unfair. And uh, I thought Tom might be concerned about this result. But in fact, in this case especially, uh, there are two things Tom was after. One is to humanize the case and to, uh, to move it away from this shock the conscience, $4 million, that's an awful lot of money, into uh, a more nuanced sense. So there's the get over that shock, and this video assists in that. The second thing is, you want to get people away from just simply accepting, uh, and those of you who teach will know this better than I, uh, you want to get away from simply accepting what the Supreme Court asserts. And this video dislodged uh, students, not only in some of these results, but also in, in how they interacted in the class. So it's both a success and a little bit troubling. And so uh, I wanted to raise with, with Tom and his team issues about introducing a new medium. And uh, for, uh, in the law school context, anything that goes well beyond text or, or simple uh, or discussion is, is a new medium. And you introduce a new kind of narrative, uh, a very uh, uh, stop and go, uh, different points of view kind of narrative, especially when it's done with that level of sophistication. Uh, new frameworks. You introduce a point of view. The camera itself becomes a point of view. And uh, questions about where do we film these people? What's behind them? Uh, what are they wearing? All become issues of great relevance. Balance, and, and I think the project is very successful in approaching balance, but suddenly you have an incredible number of axes where balance needs to be uh, maintained. Uh, time span, the measuring time how they're presented. Uh, you have characters, uh, very southern accents, southern personalities. How do you represent them uh, without uh, violating some other regional sensibility? Question. Yeah, well, uh, I'll let Todd answer that in an affirmative sense, since he has to work with actually those problems. But that's exactly uh, the kind of issue that comes in where, rather than just a representation of their language, which may be a summary of, of what was otherwise a halting presentation, uh, when you actually have, when you see them, it introduces this problem. I'm not going to answer that for you today. <laughs> Uh, and again, as I pointed out earlier, uh, you're unmooring students from the authority of the court, which we see as a benefit in this project. But it, 
the thing to keep in mind is you're moving into a media realm. Uh, these students have perceived this kind of thing in a media context from day one. They're used to people being represented ironically through uh, investigative reporting, or they're used to uh, seeing the hero with the uh, investigative reporter. So there, there's a whole new context that needs to be addressed when you're working in this kind of medium. And uh, I, again, I'm, I won't be able to answer it, but I'm going to turn it back over to Todd because he has to deal with these affirmative problems and he's going to talk more technical. I, I can answer your question now, I guess. Um, it is difficult, and a lot of it has to do with our case selection. Um, we talk to the people quite a bit before we decide if we're going to do the case or not. If, if we've got, I mean, if we've, we can, we can isolate a couple in, important cases for a topic, and if one has very inarticulate people that are not wanting to talk to us or just don't present themselves very well, we may not choose that case, or we may put them in less and have their legal people speak for them. Um, we do what we can. Am I just right after this? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, some of the technical aspects that go into making this. Um, and uh, the first, the first thing. I think is, excuse me, having someone with experience um, in video production is a good place to start. Um, there wasn't a lot of learning curve when we started this project um, because I had been producing video for several years. I had gotten my degree in film and video production um, at the University of Iowa. Um, while I was there, I spent my summers working on uh, feature films such as the star-studded nail-biting Mommy 2, which I'm sure you've all seen. Um, after I graduated, um, I got a job at a post-production company, um, worked for clients such as uh, Discovery Channel, Learning Channel, E! Entertainment Television, Comedy Central, QVC. Uh, I worked there several years making commercials, making instructional videos and documentaries before I came to Duke Law. Um, but besides having someone who knows what they're doing, you're going to need a lot of gear. I'll start with our, our field equipment. We shoot all of our footage on a Canon XL1S camera. Um, it's a uh, it's a three chip camera with near broadcast quality picture. Uh, you can shoot in modes ranging from uh, fully automatic to complete manual control, where you can have precise control over focus, white balance, aperture, anything that um, you would need for shot composition. Uh, this camera shoots on mini DV tape stock, um, which is again near broadcast quality. It's very reasonably priced, which is good because we shoot a lot of footage. And when I say that our equipment is near broadcast quality, um, the law school obviously isn't looking to enter in the world of commercial video, but our equipment is kind of on the low end of professional grade, but I, they definitely have spent enough for us to produce a high-quality product. Um, we may not get on the Discovery Channel, but um, we're pretty happy with it. So another key component to shooting video is having a good tripod. And this is one of the first things that um, I talked Wayne into buying when I started. Um, it really makes a world of difference, especially when shooting all that background footage when you saw all the pans and the tilts. Um, it's, it's just because of that tripod. We also, uh, we also bring a light kit to our interviews, which um, having precise control over the lighting scheme really adds a lot of production value. Um, my entire setup for one interview probably takes 45 minutes to an hour, and most of that is spent tweaking the lights um, for the best look. Uh, another piece of equipment that's in invaluable is having a nice monitor that is calibrated to my computer back in the editing suite. That way I know when I'm setting up a shot, I know exactly what it's going to look like when I get back home. Um, let's see. After the lights are set up, um, we set up the microphones. We've got a couple of these Sony lavalier microphones. They're uh, pretty high grade. They've got a good signal to no noise ratio and, and give a good quality sound. Um, a lot of documentary crews have, uh, have their own sound guy. And because of our small <laughs> crew, um, I don't have that luxury, so I have to have a good camera, that, or I'm sorry, a good microphone that I know I can rely on. 
Um, all of this gear travels with us, and we do a lot of traveling, so we had to invest in a number of carry, uh, sturdy cases. I carry on that camera bag, Professor Metzloff takes the light kit, and then the tripod case and the gray case, everything else is in there. Um, very well packed, so when it flies through the x-ray screeners at 100 miles per hour, nothing gets broken. Um, let's see. So before I, I, I get into our editing, um, I want to talk just for a second about some, some shooting techniques. As I mentioned earlier, we, we go to great length to make these fair and balanced, and that starts really with the interview itself. Um, there are a variety of camera techniques that, that I could use to portray the interview subjects in a particular light. Um, if I'm shooting with the camera kind of at a high level looking down on the person, they may subconsciously appear smaller or weaker or insignificant. Um, if I have the uh, camera below eye level looking up at them, it makes them look more powerful, more authoritative, more important. Um, if I zoom too much in on a person and do the extreme close-up that I'm sure you've seen a hundred times in interviews, um, you may think the person is lying to you. Um, and and even, even if I've got someone looking directly into the camera rather than off camera, um, you may feel like they're trying to persuade you of something or trying to sell you on something. Um, so I don't employ any of these techniques. I, I try and shoot all my interviews as neutral as possible. Um, I have the camera at eye level, person looking slightly off camera, um, and never shooting extreme close-ups. And the same can be said for lighting techniques. There's a lot of ways that lighting can contribute to the perception you have of the person. Um, too much shadow can make the person seem mysterious or evil. Um, on the other hand, if you have too much light, well, you get the picture. Um, so we shoot everyone with fairly even lighting. Oops. Whoa. Um, across their face, we try and keep the backgrounds as neutral as possible. Um, interesting, but not distracting. OK. So next, I'm going to talk about the post-production, the editing. Uh, as far as video editing goes, the majority of editing happens on Macintosh systems. Um, ours is no exception. I've edited on a G4. Uh, we recently got a G5 um, for another editing station. and. Um, this is what my edit suite looks like. I've got two monitors set up. Editing video really takes up a lot of real estate um, on a monitor. I've got the television, which is also cal calibrated to everything. Um, a few v VCR decks, some nice speakers, and then um, a uh, DV deck right there, which um, I'll give you a closer look at that. I could use the camera to serve as a VCR to input um, the, the footage, but this is this is designed for for the, doing that. It's it's kind of a workhorse. It's a very nice um, addition to the uh, edit suite, um, and it also will not just run mini DV tapes, but it is a DV cam deck, so it can take a larger format DV cam tape, which are more sturdy, more reliable, and that's what I use to make my masters on. Okay. Um, what you can't see in this picture is my hard drive space. Video takes up a ton of hard drive space. Um, the rate that I digitize is about one gig of space for every five minutes of footage. Each one of these projects has hours of footage, um, so I've got a lot of I've got to have a lot of space. I've got the Apple XServe RAID. Um, each of these slots can hold a 250 gig drive. I only have four currently filled up, but I've got lots of room to expand. And um, I've, I've used most of the first terabyte that I have. Um, as far as the software goes, I edit on Final Cut Pro 4, which is really, um, I think, one of the best values out there as far as editing software goes. It's fairly inexpensive, but it offers most of the um, features that a $30,000 editing system offers uh, at the fraction of the cost. The timeline looks something like this. Um, that we edit all the, all the project into. The lower two levels are audio. The top three are video. Um, you can see some of those three tiered are graphics. And um, it just kind of gives you a sense of all of the clips and how they go together. This is probably uh, a minute of, of that project that you just saw. OK. Oops. Um, the edit suite is really where we spend most of our time, um, pouring over these hours of footage and trimming them down to a 20-minute project that flows together is a really big undertaking. Um, once we finalize our story and it's down to 20 minutes, we've just got a series of talking heads and blank video where the narration is. Not very interesting. Um, 
so the next step is putting all of the B-roll or background footage in. Um, so when we're in the field, I shoot a lot of that. I shoot the city skyline. I shoot people working at their desks. I shoot their office buildings. We take pictures of uh, documents, anything that we might work into the story later, um, just to make it more interesting, but also to cover up the editing because we're taking 90% of what the people tell us in these interviews and we're cutting it. We'll take a sentence from here, a sentence from here, we'll put it together to make a complete thought. We'll cut a 30, we'll, we'll cut a three minute story down to 30 seconds and um, I can make it sound smooth, but if you were to watch it, it's very jarring and um, they would look edited or manipulated, which is not what we want. Um, so that's another key use of, of putting in B-roll to smooth things out. So I'm going to show you two clips real quickly. Um, the first one is from one of our other videos. It's kind of the completed version, and it's got B-roll and everything. Um, thank you. And then after that, I'm going to show you the same clip, but in the raw footage, just so you can see um, kind of what goes into that. To increase his visibility among voters, Russell came up with a novel approach. I was sitting around with other people and we're trying to decide how to get coverage. And uh, one of them brought up uh, Arnie Carlson. Arnie Carlson was a governor here in Minnesota. And when he ran for election, he went around with a busload of people. They were called Arnie's Army. And the second uh, he stopped in town, the bus emptied out. All these people immediately had uh, signs, and he had an immediate news event. So I needed Arnie's army. The only problem, of course, was that where am I going to get the people? I don't have the money. It has to be something humorous. It's got to be uh, eye-catching. We came up with the idea that uh, I was going to have uh, a little group of cows. I don't know why. I guess it's Minnesota. The reaction was unbelievable. Uh, my cows were talking cows. We could have the cows say whatever we wanted to say. There's the, the Got Milk uh, commercials were big right then. So uh, my cow said, got worse. So I put up uh, three of these uh, uh, cutout cows, and people literally came out of buildings to come and talk to me. We'd have people drive by and moo at us. And um, the press loved it. OK, so that's the finished version. And um, let me just show you the raw footage. To increase his visibility among voters, Russell came up with a novel approach. I was sitting around with other people and we're trying to decide how you're going to get coverage. And uh, one of them brought up uh, Arnie Carlson. Arnie Carlson was a governor here in Minnesota. And when he ran for election, he went around with a busload of people. They were called Arnie's Army. And the second uh, he stopped in town, the bus emptied out. All these people immediately had uh, signs, and he didn't have an immediate news event. So I needed Army's army. The only problem, of course, was that where am I going to get the people? I don't have the money. It has to be something humorous. It's got to be uh, eye-catching. We came up with the idea that uh, I was going to have a, a little group of cows. <laughs> I don't know why. I guess it's Minnesota. The reaction was unbelievable. Uh, my cows were talking cows. We could have the cows say whatever we wanted to say. There's the, the Got Milk uh, commercials were big right then. So uh, my cows said, got worse. So I put up uh, three of these uh, uh, cutout cows, and people literally came out of buildings to come and talk to me. We had people drive by and move at us. And um, the press loved it. So that's a lot of editing. Um, and um, we realized that, that doing all this we've got a pretty big responsibility to keep these statements accurate. Um, I mean, we, we literally could make these interviews say whatever we wanted them to say um, by editing them together inappropriate, inappropriately. But we're, I mean, obviously we're obliged not to do that. Um, even though we have our interview subjects sign release forms and there's a box on it that you can check saying, I need to see this before you do anything with it. Um, not everyone fills that box out, and we'll send them a copy anyways because we want to make sure that no one feels like they've been misrepresented um, just because of all the editing we're doing. Um, and so far, everyone we've sent copies of the video to have been very happy with our work. Um, as a matter of fact, we just sent a copy to the Telly Awards, which is kind of a prestigious um, film and video award, and we just found out last week 
that we won. So the video you just saw is award-winning, and we're very excited about that. Um, okay. That's all I've got. I'm going to say one word. Because the question will probably come up, uh, what about sharing this with the legal community? And uh, it's still pretty early in the process. They've got, uh, what, three of these in the can, three or four, four in the can. And uh, at, at some point, they'll feel like they have a um, critical mass in which to think of this as a project that will interest a broad range of people. Now, what I, uh, in other words, I'm kind of uh, shuffling around saying, well, no decision has been made about how to share this uh, in, in every possible uh, context. However, I can say, if I can get this up, we've also been working on a website. Uh, this is just a mock-up, but the idea is that uh, the results of the video project would be put in a broader context uh, where we've collected other materials for these, these same particular cases. Uh, don't look at the URL. This is just a mock-up. You'll never get anything out of it. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, we, we were hoping that the website would be done by now, uh, but it's not. But uh, uh, just, just to point out uh, what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make here, you'll see up above where it says Exploring Critical Issues, Professor and Class Information. Our intention is to create a, a site, a place on the web, where faculty can come and create their own personal view of the resources that we're putting together. So that uh, faculty member X can pick out affirmative action if that's what's of interest to him or her. Uh, do some customization and present the resources that we're uh, putting together, including the videos. So. Uh, uh, there's no announcement date uh, on that right now, but uh, if you're on Technoids, if you're in touch with uh, uh, Cali, you will definitely hear about it when it's available. And with that, we'll take some questions. Yes. That's right, and I, I would agree with that. Where, uh, for the record, um, the, the question is, how do you avoid the issue that whoever's creating this storyboard is creating the story? And uh, Todd, do you want to speak to that? Well, you're right. Um, and we, I, I don't think we let, we don't let the interviews really drive the story, although to some extent they have to. Um, we use narration quite a bit to kind of bridge those gaps and bring in points that we feel need to be brought in. Um, there's three of us that, that work on this, um, all with different viewpoints, and I think because of that collaboration, it, it helps to create as balanced a story as we can. Uh, the question is, how much have we spent on current equipment? Uh, well, I mean, some of this was at the law school before I started, um, but roughly, sure. Um, give me a minute to compute that, and I'll take another question. Well, certainly, there is a connection. Um, this is actually also funded by that same grant. 
So uh, there's that uh, kind of material connection. Uh, we, we learned a lot of lessons through the casebook that, that is still being used at Duke. Um, it's not been uh, commercialized or distributed, unfortunately. But um, uh, we learned a lot of lessons through that. We discovered that we could bring the video production in-house and do uh, a lot more with the money that was available through this source. So um, there's that connection. It's a, a different philosophy in terms of production. Uh, we've concentrated on these documentaries. Uh, the other uh, thing, uh, the other project was scenario-based, interview-based, kind of monolithic interviews. Uh, probably a little higher production value on the, on the other one, uh, just in terms of um, maybe not raw resources, but uh, they never wanted to distribute the other project through the web. And uh, we, we certainly have a commitment to do that. Yeah. Can you briefly summarize the grants you got and where? Um, I don't know that we're supposed to publicly uh, identify the grant giver. Uh, it was a considerable amount of money over uh, several years, and it's running out. <laughs> No, no, it was a, a foundation, yeah, private foundation. Todd, did you have your numbers? Uh, I would say around 20,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're. Yeah, and, and yes, follow up? I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. With for sure. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't know that question. I'm not even sure if if he scared them with um, a grading on that. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't know, because those are all interesting questions about whether, for the record, about uh, the circumstances under which the quiz was given. It, it was really f for his information and for our inf information rather than some other aspect. But I don't know the exact circumstances. Uh, it's 5 o'clock. Appreciate the questions. We'll be here. And uh, thank you. professional yeah. in terms of criticize it because <laughs> we did it on a much more budget basis. Uh, uh, let's see. Well, what we do is... Uh, I, I don't think... Uh, would you mind just sharing the URL now and we can get in touch yeah. later? No, no, no. no. It's, it's you know, similar. It's a 20 thing. It's, I've got to find the URL on ah. here.
Send me an email and tell me what you guys think. Yeah, I'm going to be off next week, but thanks. I'd be interested in hearing. Thank you. 